The airport in Rhinelander, Wisconsin buzzed with an unusual amount of activity. Three charter planes arrived at the tiny facility that evening, and that was not normal. Curious townspeople gathered on the runway as a large number of men unloaded supplies from the planes. A short, well-dressed man told the crowd the men were all members of a wedding party, but that seemed extremely far-fetched. At about 6 p.m., a car sped onto the runway. The driver jumped out and ran over to the well-dressed man. The driver repeated urgent news, and the man's face sank. He turned to the crowd. He spotted a 17-year-old young man. He asked the teenager to give him and two others a ride to a nearby Ford dealership. On the way, the young man proudly told his passengers about the black 1934 Ford Deluxe Coupe they were riding in. He bragged it could go as fast as 103 miles an hour. At the dealership, the well-dressed man asked about available automobiles. He was told he would have to wait at least an hour. He turned to the 17-year-old and offered $15 for the use of the kid's car for the night. When the young man hesitated, the well-dressed man, Special Agent Melvin Purvis, told him if he didn't let him use the car, they would simply commandeer it. The young man accepted the $15, and Purvis and his agents raced away from the airport toward a bloody confrontation with John Dillinger and Babyface Nelson. From Black Barrel Media, this is Season 4 of Infamous America. I'm your host, Chris Wimmer. In this season, we're telling the story of the most notorious bank robber in modern American history, John Dillinger. Thanks to Best Fiends for supporting Infamous America. Best Fiends is an exciting puzzle experience unlike other puzzle games out there. Best Fiends updates the game monthly with new levels and events so it never gets old. Download it for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. This is Chapter 8, Showdown at Little Bohemia. Billy Frechette pulled up to Eddie Green's home in her boyfriend's car. She ran inside. John Dillinger had been shot in the leg and currently sat bleeding in his automobile. The couple had narrowly escaped their apartment in St. Paul, Minnesota. Federal agents had confronted them, and Dillinger had led Billy out of the building during a brief firefight with a local detective. In the process, Dillinger took a slug in the leg. They made it to the car, and Billy drove them to the home of fellow bank robber Eddie Green. Green called a shady doctor. The doctor inspected Dillinger's leg and saw that the bullet had passed clean through. It caused a lot of bleeding, but the doctor wouldn't have to perform surgery to remove the bullet. The doctor cleaned the wound, wrapped it in bandages, and charged Dillinger $90. And the doctor would later be arrested for the act. Back at Dillinger and Billy's apartment, law enforcement took stock of the contents. There were the typical effects of a criminal. Weapons, ammunition, silencers, and bulletproof vests. There were also the exotic accoutrements of a flashy couple. For him, a sheepskin-lined leather jacket, a blue silk dressing gown, and a large chinchilla overcoat. For her, frilly silk nightgowns, 11 pairs of pink underwear, and several expensive party dresses. While the inventory happened, J. Edgar Hoover raged. He was furious with the couple's apparently effortless escape but Special Agent Melvin Purvis was working fast. He sent agents to bars and nightclubs in Chicago to try to find anyone with a connection to the couple. He built a network of informants. Then, on April 2nd, bureau agents found Dillinger's friend, Eddie Green. A firefight broke out, and Green was shot multiple times. He survived the initial battle, but then agents interrogated him relentlessly at the hospital. After the pain and stress of the interrogation, Eddie Green died from his injuries. The agents claimed they fired on him after he refused their directions to halt. The press described it as more of an assassination by government goons who shot an unarmed man in the back. Angry politicians called for investigations into the Bureau's tactics. Hoover didn't seem bothered. He was pleased that his agents had taken down one of Dillinger's associates. To him, 
things were moving in the right direction. He decided to double down. Hoover sent 50 agents to St. Paul and Minneapolis. They were led by two assistant directors, and they had one mission. Stop Dillinger and all other gangsters currently at large, like Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy Floyd, Bonnie and Clyde, and many more. Within three days of Eddie Green's capture, federal agents had arrested more than 20 career criminals. But none of them was John Dillinger. Supposed sightings of Dillinger came in from nearby states. One near Chicago reported Dillinger was traveling in disguise as a nun. With the walls closing in, Dillinger headed to the one place that Hoover didn't anticipate. He went home to Mooresville, Indiana. John Dillinger brought Billy Frechette home with him and they spent almost a week laying low in his hometown. Dillinger's family noticed, of course, that he walked with a limp. But he told them it wasn't a big deal. It was just a routine injury in his line of work. Dillinger and Billy enjoyed a happy and relaxed vacation. They spent lots of time with numerous members of his family. They took walks through the woods and nearby farms. Dillinger played with young relatives, flew kites, and happily posed for pictures. There are famous photographs taken during this time that show the outlaw dressed in a nice suit and with a big smile on his face. He's holding a Tommy gun under one arm and what looks like a pistol in the other hand. The pistol is carved crudely out of wood and painted black. Dillinger's father later told a reporter that, as his son was leaving, a frightening thought came to his mind. He said his son had seen a lot of the country and had gotten even, and he sensed John Jr. was going to die. Billy Frechette saw a different side of Dillinger. As the couple drove back to Chicago, Dillinger spoke fondly of their visit to his childhood home. He wanted to settle down somewhere nice. He wanted to have kids and lead a normal life. But none of that was ever going to happen. Their world was about to come crashing down. J. Edgar Hoover changed his policy on women like Billy Frechette. Until now, the girlfriends of gangsters had been considered unwitting bystanders. None of the girlfriends arrested in Tucson were convicted of crimes. But from now on, they were considered willing accomplices. And Billy's time was up. On April 9, 1934, Special Agent Melvin Purvis's new network of informants paid off. He received a phone call with information about Dillinger's location. The informant said Dillinger and Billy were back in Chicago, looking for a safe place to hide out. Billy reached out to someone she knew and felt she could trust, a man named Larry Strang. We know that Strang was one of Purvis's informants, but we still don't know if he was the one who made the call. Billy and Larry Strang were scheduled to meet at 8 p.m. at the Tumble Inn, a corner tavern often populated by unsavory characters. Purvis gathered 12 special agents for a raid. In typical Purvis form, he led the team himself. Dressed uncharacteristically in shabby attire, Purvis entered the tavern at 8 p.m. The other agents waited outside for his signal. He saw Larry String, but Billy had not arrived. She was outside in the car with John Dillinger, Dillinger circled the block in his Ford, looking for law enforcement. Purvis's men were well hidden and escaped the outlaw's sharp eye. Dillinger parked across the street from the bar. Billy wanted him to wait while she went inside. She was worried about being separated. She said the last time he went somewhere without her, he'd been arrested. He agreed to wait in the car, and she kissed him goodbye. Billy crossed the street and entered the tavern. She found Larry String at the bar. Purvis sat nearby, but he looked like a regular old customer. Billy walked towards String, and Purvis offered her a bar stool, but she declined. Purvis stood up and walked outside. With a simple nod of his head, he signaled to his agents, then went back inside the tavern. His men followed, armed with submachine guns. Dillinger watched as agents poured into the bar. He circled the block, desperate to find a way to rescue Billy. 
He had a Tommy gun, but he was so badly outnumbered that a one-man assault would get him caught at best and killed at worst. He watched as his girlfriend was led from the tavern in handcuffs and shoved into a vehicle. Alone in his car, John Dillinger cried. American history and true crime are two of my passions. But when I need to take a step away and take a break, my mental palate cleanser is Best Fiends. It's a challenging puzzle game, but it's also casual, so anyone can play. I plan strategies and collect new characters and figure out the best way to solve each puzzle. The levels are full of bright colors and fun designs, and I find myself moving immediately from one level to the next and solving puzzle after puzzle. But that's up to you. You can spend as much or as little time in the game as you'd like. Best Fiends is a unique experience. It's updated every month, and you don't need the internet to play it, which means you can play it anywhere. So engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cool characters. With over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. And that's Best Fiends. It's friends without the R. Billy Furchette faced relentless interrogation. Federal agents tried various tactics to get her to break. They wouldn't let her sleep. They smacked her around. She said later, They kept me up, talking to me until I didn't know what I was saying. Then they'd leave me alone for a long time. I was nearly crazy. They thought John was coming to rescue me. She gave them misinformation at every opportunity. When the feds mentioned Dillinger's leg injury, she denied it. When they said there was a trail of blood in the snow leading to their garage, she claimed it did not come from a bullet wound, but from her monthly sickness. Billy Frechette was unbreakable. On Friday the 13th, 1934, agents dragged her into federal court to face charges of conspiracy to harbor a federal fugitive. The U.S. attorney requested bail of no less than $200,000 on the basis that John Dillinger was swimming in cash. The judge settled on a smaller number, $65,000, which is equal to a million dollars today. After that, Billy was taken to the Chicago House of Corrections where she was finally allowed to talk to her lawyer. Her lawyer was Dillinger's lawyer, the flashy and corrupt Louis Paquette. Together, they concocted a story designed to embarrass the Bureau they told reporters that Dillinger had actually been at the bar with Billy. The agents had been so focused on her that they hadn't seen America's number one bank robber. Hoover believed it, and he was not pleased. He was also unhappy with Dillinger's growing popularity with the public. Support for a pardon was growing among the masses, with some saying the outlaw should run for governor and simply pardon himself. Dillinger's father said that if his son was free of the charges against him, he'd probably make a pretty good police officer. Car dealerships across the country boasted in their ads that Dillinger used their vehicles. A billboard in Pennsylvania invited Dillinger to visit a local restaurant. And a popular lottery in Indianapolis allowed people to bet on the date they predicted Dillinger would ultimately be caught. Claims of Dillinger sightings reached unparalleled heights. Robberies in numerous states were blamed on the famous outlaw. In Flint, Michigan, six bandits robbed a bank. It was a gang of five men and one woman. Four of the five men were identified as John Dillinger. A 25-year-old man in Indiana named Ralph Alsman looked so much like Dillinger that he feared he'd be shot on sight by a police officer. He'd already been arrested by mistake 17 times. Sightings made their way across the Atlantic Ocean. A captain in Scotland called police after receiving reports that Dillinger had jumped aboard his ship. All ships entering France were searched for the American outlaw, and Scotland Yard had a team looking for him in England. Meanwhile, the added attention and the recent close calls made the real John Dillinger think more seriously about plastic surgery. The procedure would cost around $5,000. He'd lost a bundle of cash when he and Billy had fled their apartment, 
and he needed to replenish his funds. It was time to get back together with the gang. Little Bohemia is a secluded camp just above Manitowish Lake, 13 miles south of Mercer, Wisconsin. The main building on the property is a lodge that sits 600 feet back from the road. The two-story log structure still stands today. On April 20th, 1934, John Dillinger arrived for a weekend getaway. Also arriving that afternoon were Dillinger's recent gang members, Tommy Carroll, Homer Van Meter, Red Hamilton and their girlfriends, and Babyface Nelson and his wife. The guest rooms were on the second floor. Rooms in the front overlooked the gravel parking lot. Rooms in the back overlooked Little Star Lake. The first floor contained a kitchen, a dining room, a bar, and a large recreation area. The busy summer season had not yet begun, so the gang was mostly on their own. The lodge's owner, Emil Winotka, didn't recognize the group at first. They arrived in multiple cars during the afternoon. He said it was about four hours after Dillinger's arrival that he recognized the famous outlaw from having seen his picture in the newspapers. After supper, Dillinger and the four other outlaws invited Winotka to play poker with them. As Winotka sat at the table with some of the most wanted criminals in America, he finally recognized John Dillinger. Dillinger won the game. Winotka lost between $16 and $18. But the next night he did better. He won $28. On Saturday, the lodge owner said the group got up at about 8.30 a.m. and spent the day taking walks and reading. At some point during the day, Winotka's eight-year-old son played a game of catch with Dillinger and Babyface Nelson. Dillinger was gentle with the boy but the sadistic Nelson threw the baseball as hard as he could. The boy had to stop playing because his hand hurt. Winotka's wife said later that she and her husband talked about telling the authorities. They decided to send a letter to the assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago. Winotka wrote it, and his wife drove it into Mercer, Wisconsin to mail it. She told the gangster she was going to her brother's house for the birthday party of her nephew, and she actually did go to the party. When she arrived, she told her brother-in-law about the men at Little Bohemia. He thought that contacting the local cops would be a mistake. They would be outmatched. And forming a citizen's posse was also a bad call. He had a different idea. The next day, he drove into Rhinelander, 50 miles south of Little Bohemia, and called an authority in Chicago. A little while later, the phone rang in the home of the special agent in charge of the Bureau Chicago field office, Melvin Purvis. Purvis spoke to a U.S. Marshal. The Marshal said a man in Wisconsin seemed to have credible information about the location of John Dillinger. Purvis called the brother-in-law, who was understandably hesitant to keep talking about the matter. He quietly told Purvis, the man you want most is up here. Purvis pushed him for more detail and the brother-in-law finally stated that six members of the Dillinger gang were at a resort called Little Bohemia, and John Dillinger was one of them. The brother-in-law was pretty sure they'd be there for at least another day. Purvis launched into action. He said he'd be there that night. He told the brother-in-law to meet him at the Rhinelander Airport. Purvis called J. Edgar Hoover and told him the news. Then he called the Chicago field office and told every available agent to get ready. They were flying to Wisconsin to capture John Dillinger. Assistant Director Hugh Clegg was the first to arrive in Rhinelander. He brought four agents from Minneapolis on a chartered plane, and four more followed in a car. His first task was to get more cars for a raid on Little Bohemia. Clegg went to a local Ford dealership. The manager said he wanted no part of an operation that would capture bootleggers. Bootleggers were popular in these parts. If the manager hurt the bootleggers, it would be bad for business. Assistant Director Clegg assured him they were not after bootleggers. The manager offered a compromise. He would give Clegg some cars, 
but only ones that were being driven by salesmen right now. When the salesmen came back to the lot, Clegg could have those cars. Clegg agreed and went back to the airport to meet Melvin Purvis. Purvis and his team arrived at the Rhinelander airport in two chartered planes. Purvis surveyed his agents on the plane and compared them to soldiers waiting for zero hour. They knew this mission would not be a Sunday picnic. If Dillinger and his gang were at the lodge, they would not come out with their hands up. But before the agents could even face off with Dillinger's crew, they had to survive the plane ride. That was no Sunday picnic either. The turbulence was so bad that many of the agents threw up on the plane, and so did one of the pilots. When the plane touched down, one of the brakes failed. The plane spun wildly. One of the wings nearly scraped the tarmac. When the aircraft finally stopped, the agents stumbled outside, grateful to be on the ground. Purvis met Clegg on the tarmac, and as instructed, the brother-in-law was there as well. The brother-in-law said he had not personally seen Dillinger, but he positively identified a photograph of one of the men at the lodge as gangster Tommy Carroll. The brother-in-law sketched a diagram of the lodge. One side butted up against the lake, so the agents only needed to cover three sides of the property. The gangsters had told the resort owners that they would be leaving in the morning. The agents wanted to attack the resort just before dawn. The Winatkas and their employees planned to hide in the lodge's basement at 4 a.m. Purvis checked his watch. It was 6 p.m. That gave him 10 hours to get his men in place. In the next couple hours, he'd be able to pick up the cars at the Ford dealership. That would still give him plenty of time to get to the lodge and reconnoiter the property before the raid. With the plan in place, the brother-in-law left the airport and Purvis turned his attention to his men as they unloaded their gear from the planes. There was a lot of it, but they had time. Except no, they didn't. Back at the lodge, John Dillinger felt uneasy. Something was wrong. The owners of the lodge were acting funny. He couldn't be sure, but he suspected they might have turned him in. He changed his plans. He told the crew they would be leaving tonight, right after dinner. In Rhinelander, the brother-in-law was driving back into town when he spotted his wife racing in the other direction toward the airport. When they saw each other, they stopped and she told him the news. They were out of time. The gang was leaving tonight. The brother-in-law floored it back to the airport. He sped onto the tarmac. By now, a crowd had gathered at the small facility. Three chartered planes had arrived that evening and hard-looking men were unloading piles of supplies. Something big was clearly going on. Purvis tried to convince the crowd that the men and the supplies were for some kind of crazy wedding party, and it's doubtful the crowd bought it. The brother-in-law jumped out of his car and ran up to Purvis. He told the special agent about Dillinger's change of plan. Purvis's face dropped. The planes were barely unloaded. The agents had no cars. They were an hour away from Little Bohemia, and they were supposed to infiltrate a property they had never seen before, in the dark, and then attack a group of heavily armed gangsters with no time to prepare. The agents were at a severe disadvantage, but Purvis said later the fever for action overpowered everything else. They had to get to Little Bohemia now. Purvis and two other agents piled into a black Ford coupe driven by a 17-year-old young man. The teenager rushed them to the Ford dealership that assistant director Clegg had visited earlier in the evening. The manager said again, there were no cars available to borrow. The salesman who had them had not returned. Purvis was out of time and out of patience. He commandeered five vehicles, including the young man's car, which he borrowed for $15. The caravan raced toward Little Bohemia at 7.30 p.m. Each car carried a machine gun, a rifle, and a shotgun. 20 miles into the journey, one of the cars broke down. Soon after, another car blew a tire. Eight agents found themselves riding on the running boards of the remaining three cars in the bitter cold. 
Two miles south of Little Bohemia, they stopped at a different lodge. They turned off the car's headlights so they wouldn't give away their presence. It was now extremely dark outside. The men split into three units. Purvis and Clegg led one group. They put on steel vests that weighed 24 pounds. They would attack from the front. The other two units would cut off escapes from the left and the right. In the lodge, Dillinger wanted to be gone by now. He waited impatiently for two gang members to return from the long trip to St. Paul, Minnesota. He'd sent them to pick up $4,000 of his money, and they weren't back yet. Outside, it was almost 9.30 p.m., and three cars of federal agents crept up to the lodge at Little Bohemia. About 100 feet from the building, Clegg and Purvis blocked the exit by parking their cars in a V. The third car parked behind them to reinforce the blockade. In the lodge, two dogs began to bark at something they sensed outside in the dark. John Dillinger, Red Hamilton, Tommy Carroll, and Homer Van Meter were in their rooms on the second floor. Babyface Nelson was in a separate cabin nearby, but his wife was in the main building. About 75 people had been at the lodge earlier in the evening for Sunday dinner, but now there were only three left. The three men were drunk, and now they stumbled outside to their car. They fired up the engine and turned on the radio. Big band music blared into the night. The driver threw the vehicle into gear, but he didn't turn on the headlights. The three men barreled right toward the blockade of federal agents. Purvis, Clegg, and two other agents stood in front of their cars with machine guns. They shouted orders to stop. They identified themselves as federal officers, but they couldn't be heard over the radio. One of the agents shouted to open fire, and the agents unloaded on the car. The driver took a shotgun blast to the arm and a bullet to the leg. He stopped the car, jumped out, and ran behind Babyface Nelson's cabin. One of the passengers was already dead. The last man fell out of the car with four bullets in his shoulder. He was the lodge's cook, and he was almost 60 years old. He also had the misfortune of sharing a first name with Dillinger. When the agent shouted at him to identify himself, he said simply, I'm John. Purvis ordered him to put his hands up, but John Morris stood up on shaky legs and shuffled drunkenly away, and the agents held their fire. Babyface Nelson's cabin became ground zero for a few moments. He fired at the agents outside and barely missed Purvis three times. One shot hit the ground near Purvis's foot and two more slammed into the trees behind him. Nelson burst out of his cabin and escaped into the woods. John Morris, the wounded cook, dropped down on Nelson's porch. He pulled a flask from his pocket and took a drink. Somehow in the unfolding chaos, he lumbered back to the lodge and called a friend. He said he'd wandered into a robbery and he needed a ride. In reality, he'd stumbled into a showdown that lasted all night. Gang member Tommy Carroll crawled outside and jumped down from the roof of the lodge. He landed about 10 feet away and took off running. An agent stationed near the back identified himself and opened fire with his Tommy gun. Then the agent found himself under attack. Bullets raked the area from above. He swung his gun back up to the roof and saw two men standing there firing at him. He returned fire, and two more agents joined in the effort. The three of them blasted the roof until they were sure they'd forced the two gunmen back inside. Then the agents retreated to the cover of the trees. As bullets flew, the owners and employees hid in the basement. Babyface Nelson's wife and two other young women ran downstairs to join them. They wisely decided the basement was a better hiding spot than their original choice, under a bed upstairs. Outside, the two gang members, a man and a woman, who'd gone to St. Paul to get Dillinger's money, returned to Little Bohemia at exactly the wrong moment. They pulled up to the blockade and an agent shouted at them to identify themselves. They reversed their car and sped away while agents fired at them. The gang members didn't fully understand the situation. 
and after they escaped the resort, they went back to snoop around. When they returned, the agents fired on them again. A bullet hit one of the tires. The driver struggled to control the car, and the passenger reached for the door handle. She fell out and broke her shoulder when she hit the ground. The man stopped the car, pulled her back in, and took off again. Melvin Purvis and Assistant Director Clegg were confident they had the gangsters trapped inside. They would make their next move at daybreak. They sent some agents back to Rhinelander to pick up reinforcements. Those agents drove the hot rod Ford that the teenager had loaned to Purvis for $15. Unfortunately, the agents ran into Babyface Nelson on their way. He killed one, shot another in the head, and stole the car. At 5 a.m., the federal agents fired gas canisters into the lodge. Only the gangsters' abandoned wives and girlfriends emerged. The lodge was riddled with bullets and now filled with gas. But John Dillinger, Red Hamilton, and Homer Van Meter were long gone. Time flies by like a shot from a gun Making hay with the devil in the new day's sun Striking up the iron while the iron is hot For the life I got. Next time on Infamous America, the fiasco at Little Bohemia brings the Bureau terrible press. Dillinger becomes the Bureau's first public enemy number one, and then the infamous Woman in Red enters his life and begins to organize his downfall. That's next week on the second to last episode in our series on John Dillinger. I'm living for the minute and I'm living for the day. My own time in my own way Heading nowhere just as fast as I can Yeah, I'm riding on dunes, leaving tracks in the sand They say that's how you die, a lonely man Primary research for this season was provided by Derry Matera, author of the best-selling book, Dillinger, The Life and Death of America's First Celebrity Criminal. This season was written by Sean Puglisi and myself, Music editing and sound design by Mike Hissong at Sneaky Big Studios. Artwork by Matt Lockery of My Colorful Past. I'm your host and producer, Chris Wimmer. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Please visit our website, blackbarrelmedia.com, for more details and join us on social media. We're Black Barrel Media on Facebook and Instagram and B Barrel Media on Twitter. And if you want to contribute to the production of our shows, please visit our Patreon page. You can also find discounts on our merchandise. That's patreon.com slash Black Barrel Media. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. There's a train to Chicago and a plane to L.A. Yeah, I'm meeting in Akron and All Saints Day. Well, it got so late I forgot to call in. Yeah, well, daddy's doing business at the bar again. They say that's how you die alone. Tracks in the sand Cold-headed hearts Driving at the wind They say that's how you die A lonely man They say that's how you die A lonely man